Oh. <coughs> okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege um, to be able to be here, uh, both in a room with so many wonderful people uh, and with some wonderful friends online as well, um, and uh, to be part of this effort. Um, I, I think this is this is really important. Um, I, I can't. I could not possibly have said better all the things that have been said already this morning. Um, and, and it just is a, I think it's worth taking a pause for a second to appreciate um, the opportunity, um, both from, from Hunkal and David and everyone else who's organized this today, to get so many people in a room who don't have to convince one another <laughs> of, the, of these things, um, which is, as we all know from our work, is not typical. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we are um, we are really lucky to have with us this morning um, a number of people who have uh, who have firsthand experience working on uh, rehabilitation and reintegration of extremist offenders in other places. Uh, so this morning, um, we're joined online uh, by my friend Gulnaz Razdikova uh, in Kazakhstan who um, Steve and I just saw last week, I guess, in Almaty, uh, where she organized a, a wonderful, uh, two really excellent workshops um, with practitioners working on working on R&R &R, um, in Kazakhstan. And uh, I just wanted to explain a, a little bit sort of the ground rules for how this works since we'll have um, since we'll have several non-English speakers on this panel today for those of you uh, following along on zoom um, there is a globe icon at the bottom where you can change the language channel um, that you'll listen to and uh, for those of us here in the room our, our tech specialists will handle that for us but there will be simultaneous translation uh, of Gulnaz and Aziz's presentations um, and uh, we have with us uh, Tolat Raufadin, who I was, uh, it was my distinct pleasure to meet a year or so ago in the Maldives as well. He's done uh, really impressive work there as Director General of Monitoring, Rehabilitation, and Security Department in the Republic of the Maldives Ministry of Home Affairs. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, we have an old friend, uh, Aziz Bek Usmanov, who's the project manager for Progress Aravan, a civil society organization based in Osh. And I'll give you a little bit more about their bios um, before each of them speak, uh, but wanted to let you know who we have here. And uh, Gulnaz, Aziz, I was very glad to see you. I was very proud of you because I have this conversation. I have not answered. In the last time, there was a lot of Проблемы со здоровьем, но я очень рад с вами увидеться сегодня. Um, okay, so uh, without any further ado, I'll introduce you a bit more to Gulnaz. Uh, we're really lucky to have her here today. Um, she's the director of the Center for Analysis and Development of Interfaith Relations in Kazakhstan, in Pavlodar, Kazakhstan. And it was set up to prevent the radicalization of youth and to provide psychological and social support for radicalized individuals. Um, she's educated as a psychologist and a licensed independent forensic psychologist, and she's worked to rehabilitate radicalized individuals since 2013, and in particular uh, has played a key role in rehabilitation and reintegration of over 700 Kazakh women and children who were repatriated from Iraq and Syria since 2019. Uh, Gulnaz was the head psychologist for their rehabilitation center that all of the women moved through in the first month when they returned to the country. Um, and so she formed a really unique bond um, with all of the families that came back and has continued to support them uh, during the pandemic. Uh, she set up, uh, her own organization set up an independent project called Zoom Jusan that made it possible to connect adult returnees and specialists, theologians, doctors, and mental health professionals during the pandemic when many of them were stuck at home. And I know that she continues to provide uh, daily support for something around 100 um, of the women who are in her network and who really, really value her um, as a friend and as a supporter. And she, she fights for them in a way that um, I think no one else does, it's fair to say. 
Um, since 2021, she's been working as a national expert uh, in the rehabilitation and reintegration of returning families of foreign terrorist fighters in Kazakhstan project uh, with support of the University of Illinois, Chicago, Boston Children's Hospital, and the Department of State. We have one of the directors of that project here with us, Dr. Wine. And uh, Mike and I have both served on that project as well. Um, and Gulnaz has, has really been a key in that. She's also a member of the OSCE's International Network of Professional Women in the field of preventing and combating violent extremism and radicalization leading to terrorism in Central Asia. Because when you work for the OSCE, that's exactly how you have to say it. So, uh, Gulnaz, without any further ado, we'll turn over the floor to you. And uh, we'll be really happy to hear from you. Значит, Гулназ, это я дам слово вам. Добрый, доброе утро. Меня слышно? Да, слышно. Я очень рада слышать так много хороших слов о себе. Даже не представляла, что могу быть достойна такой высокой оценки со стороны своих коллег. На самом деле мы в Казахстане сделали очень большую работу. Мы делаем oh. маленькую паузу, пока мы не слышим перевод. Oh. Вот какая-то техническая ah, проблема. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, obviously we didn't have translation there, so we'll sort that out. Oh, it's not on the... Okay. Um, Гульназ, значит, пока мы разбираемся с этим, мы делаем а, просто с позами. Вы говорите где-то два предложения, и я вам перевожу я для аудитории здесь. Да, окей, okay, okay. давай. Окей. Ага. Okay. Все, все хорошо. Угу. Ну, хочу сказать, что процесс репатриации в Казахстане начался в январе 2019 года, и на сегодняшний день наша страна является лидером по количеству репатриантов, это не только организованная репатриация, но и неорганизованная репатриация, которая до сих пор продолжается. Uh, so she said she wanted to say first that um, the repatriation process has been ongoing in Kazakhstan since 2019. It's not just organized repatriation, but also self-returnees um, who have come back on their own. And uh, at this point, at the present day, Kazakhstan is the world leader in re repatriation of uh, formally mobilized individuals to the conflict mm -hmm. in Syria. В результате организованной репатриации в Казахстан вернулось 750 человек, и в результате неорганизованной репатриации 128 человек. Из них большее количество – это дети, в том числе и несовершеннолетние дети. Также было возвращено 37 мужчин и 36 ребенка полной сироты. Um, давайте еще раз эти цифры я не успел. 750. Это uh -huh. да. 128 это в результате самовозвращения. Okay. Понял. Um, so there have been so since 2019, 750 um, citizens have come back through the organized repatriation. 128 uh, self returnees, um, and of these. Um, there are also uh, 37 men who have returned as part of the official program. The overwhelming majority of the returnees are children. Um, 36 of the children are orphans, uh, so they return without parents at all. Mm -hmm. 37 women, из э, женщин к уголовной ответственности были привлечено 19 человек. Все остальные женщины находятся на свободе вместе со своими детьми. Mm. Um, of the men, all 37 of them were prosecuted and are currently uh, in carceral institutions in Kazakhstan. Of the women, only 19 were prosecuted. Um, and so all of the rest of the adult women returnees are living at home with their children at this point. Также была операция Русафа по возвращению детей, чьи мамы, казахстанки, отбывают пожизненное заключение в тюрьмах Ирака. По добровольному согласию этих матерей дети были привезены в Казахстан и отданы на воспитание близким родственникам. Всего было привезено 14 ребенка. 
Mm. There's been another smaller operation that's returned 14 children from Iraq um, with the voluntary um, agreement of their mothers who are serving prison terms in the Iraqi carceral system. Основная задача этой операции Жусан это безусловно гуманитарные цели, поэтому наша страна не ставила целью, чтобы разлучить матери и ребенка. Основная цель задачи это интегрировать детей и обеспечить им безопасное будущее. So Kazakhstan has approached this primarily as a humanitarian problem. Um, and so they did not um, they didn't see separating mothers from their children as a part of a humanitarian operation. So they've tried to keep families together as much as possible and uh, focus the programming on um, healthy futures for children who have returned. На момент эвакуации все женщины и дети находились на 30-дневном карантинном лагере, где происходила их медицинский осмотр, паспортизация этих женщин, социальная работа и работа с теологами и психологами. Мое знакомство с этими женщинами началось в этом лагере в мае 2019 года. All of the returnees who came as part of the organized um, repatriation program spent 30 days in an initial rehabilitation center um, where they were able to get documentation and passports um, that allowed that reinstated their, their legal status as Kazakh citizens. Um, they received medical attention and had medical needs identified. Um, during this phase, some of them um, had um, the potential for prosecution evaluated, um, but then also they were given um, access to work with uh, both theologians and psychologists. And in May 2019, that's how Gulnaz first began her work with this project. Безусловно, на момент репатриации мы прекрасно понимали, что можем столкнуться с рисками, с вызовами в нашей работе. Эти риски можно условно разделить на три большие группы. Это риски системного характера, риски организационного характера и индивидуальные риски. Um, they understood from the beginning that there were different kinds of risks um, that this program would face. Um, and they divided them into three categories, uh, systemic, organizational, and individual. И самый большой риск, которому мы не были, к сожалению, готовы, это пандемия COVID, когда офлайн встречи с женщинами стали невозможны. And the biggest risk that, of course, they unfortunately weren't able to anticipate is the COVID pandemic that made in-person meetings um, with the women impossible. Именно в этот момент мое сближение, тесное сотрудничество с женщинами усилились, потому что я организовала им онлайн консультации с тех специалистов, в которых они нуждались. And at that point, um, she developed an even closer relationship uh, with the women because she developed this Zoom Jusan online network that helped connect them to any kind of specialists that they that they needed help with uh, to, to resolve their issues. Пандемия COVID также отсрочила процесс реинтеграции детей к школе. Отсрочила в каком смысле? Ну, дети сразу не смогли пойти в школу, они ждали, пока COVID закончится. So it also delayed um, the children's reintegration in terms of education, since they weren't able to attend classes um, in person. Но несмотря на все эти риски и вызовы, мы продолжали делать свою работу, и это делала не я одна, это делала большая команда специалистов, практиков на местах. But despite all of these risks and challenges, um, the, the program went forward, uh, and she wants to emphasize that it wasn't her alone. It's a, it's a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole, um, a whole group of, of local specialists and local counselors um, who have been activated to, to support the women who've returned. Самой приоритетной задачей это являлись проблемы с физическим здоровьем женщин. И в первую очередь была и детям была оказана медицинская помощь. Um, the, 
the issue of first order for many of the returnees was medical needs, um, both for adult women and for children. Второе это психологическое благополучие женщин. And the second second need um, in terms of priorities was psychosocial. Третье это социальная реинтеграция. And the third is social reintegration. Четвертое это решение экономических ну бытовых вопросов. Um, the fourth challenge um, is resolving economic and sort of everyday life issues. И пятое это безусловно теологические консультации. And the fifth was um, theological counseling. Mm -hmm. Но э, после того, как привезли женщин в Казахстан, э, начали, началась реализация различных международных грантов и проектов в отношении этих женщин. After the women returned, um, there are a number of international organizations that also uh, started projects to help support them. Эти проекты были направлены на, ну, проводили разные мероприятия, начиная от внешней оценки и заканчивая наращиванием потенциала местных практик. So they they engaged in a lot of different areas, um, from doing external needs assessments to developing um, the skills for local practitioners. Безусловно, для нас очень важна внешняя оценка нашей работы. And it goes without saying that for them, it, the external assessment of their work was really important. И вот благодаря проекту государственного финансируемого государственным департаментом реализуемым университетом Иллинойса это внешняя оценка, которая была произведена под руководством доктора Стивена Вейна и Ноа Такера. Um, and she's in particular grateful for the external assessment um, that came from the project supported by the U.S. State Department, the University of Illinois, um, and uh, she mentioned Steve and I. Я считаю, что это самая объективная оценка, потому что они непосредственно встречались со всеми женщинами и проводили интервью в со всех городах Казахстана. She felt like that external assessment was particularly important because um, we actually traveled to meet directly with the women um, in, in cities across Kazakhstan. В результате этого исследования был выработан реальный инструмент по внешней оценке, вот программ репатриации. And as a, <coughs> as a result of that, um, as a result of that program, um, there, she's been able to develop we, our practitioner network together, has been able to develop plans for what to do next. Мне говорят, что у нас мало времени осталось. А, все, окей. В результате этого проекта даже была создана команда сильных практиков в Республике Казахстан, ну и Центральной Азии, которые не, ну, специалистов по репатриации. And as a result of that project, um, we've been able to put together a practitioner's network um, for people to support practitioners, not just in Kazakhstan, but in the whole Central Asian region. And she said she really wants to thank everybody who's been involved in that program uh, in particular because it gave them the ability to um, to construct a program that will be long-lasting. And that's, and that's uh, the end of her remarks, and she'll be happy to take other questions. Okay. Спасибо огромное, Гульназ, и за такие добрые слова в отношении нам. Я думаю... Thank you, Gulnaz, for such warm words. That's... Okay. Can you hear my translation right now? Okay. Yeah. Saying? Wonderful. Um, so now I don't have to translate anymore. I was I was hoping for an extra paycheck. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So our next speaker, um, I, I'm really delighted to welcome Tolat uh, Rafawadin, who, as I mentioned, is Director General of Monitoring, Rehabilitation, and Security Department at the Republic of the Maldives Ministry of Home Affairs, where he also chairs the Rehabilitation and Re Reintegration Committee formed under the Anti-Terrorism Act. 
Among other duties, um, he reviews and monitors rehabilitation programs conducted for prisoners, including those convicted for terrorism-related offenses, and advises the Ministry of Home Affairs, the Correctional Service, and other custodial facilities on prisoner rehabilitation. This includes the Republic of the Maldives National Reintegration Center, the NRC, set up to rehabilitate and reintegrate foreign fighters and their family members, women and children, returned from Iraq and Syria. Tolat previously served as a political advisor for the Embassy of Japan in the Maldives and was also trained as an Interpol operations officer to serve as officer in charge for the Ba Atoll region and performed a variety of managerial and security tasks. He's also currently an associate lecturer at the Maldives National University. Thank you so much for being with us, Tolat, and we'll turn over the microphone to you. Uh, thank you very much, Anoa, and I, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and and good, good morning to uh, participants attending from uh, Washington and good evening from Maldives as well. Um, so um, my uh, program, uh, my uh, presentation is based on rehabilitation, the integration of foreign uh, fighter returnees. Um, in the Maldives and uh, people who have traveled to Syria and com uh, designated conflict zones. Um, so mainly, <clears throat> uh, what we are, uh, what the repatriation efforts are based in people who are currently in Syria. Um, they've been traveling uh, to um, Syria since um, early 2013 or 2014, and then once um, ISIS was defeated, they have started to return back. So I, I will be looking into the legal um, framework um, of um, uh, of the rehabilitation programs that we are conducting. Um, uh, next slide, please. So the legal and the regulatory framework is based on the Anti-Terrorism Act. Uh, that's, uh, enacted in 2015. Um, that's been revised uh, three times now um, to cater the needs of um, the returnees. Um, the latest was in, um, uh, in 2021, the latest revision was that. And under this act, we have uh, established the National Reintegration Center to um, reintegrate, rehabilitate and reintegrate uh, returnees from conflict zones. And we also operate under the, the two regulations, uh, the Rehabilitation Reintegration Regulation and the Counterterrorism Regulation that's enacted under Terrorism Act. So part of that regulation um, gives us powers to do, power to do um, rehabilitation programs for not only for returnees, but also people who are convicted of um, terrorism acts and who people who are in uh, prisons as well. So they, um, it also provides us um, procedures for people, uh, sorry, children born under in, in the conflict zone and what we uh, have to do for these children, how are we going to provide them citizenship um, and their travel permits. Next slide, please. So the process for returnees is uh, not very complicated. Um, uh, once they arrive, to, once we start processing, we first, um, for for example, children born in conflict zones, we we have the procedure in the act. So we take their DNA samples or determine whether they are Maldivian citizens. So that's a uh, court process will be continuing in that process. Once that um, process is done, we will start bringing uh, families back. Uh, with the current repatriation efforts, we have already completed that uh, phase now. Uh, so it's a matter of time that uh, a new uh, batch will a new batch will be returning to Maldives. So once they return to Maldives, we will be doing the medical checkups. Um, that that's we we are coordinating with the Ministry of Health and the, the local hospitals, and we will be um, presenting the clients to court. Uh, within 48 hours so that um, the risk assessment process that's done by police will uh, start. Um, within that period, we will be housing them in the National Reintegration Center. 
And the, the risk assessment will determine whether a client is a victim or a suspect. Um, once they, if they are determined as a victim, uh, they will be uh, admitted to the rehabilitation program. But also it's important to keep in mind we uh, children above the age of 15 will be subject to the risk assessment and they can also be subject to us uh, becoming a suspect based on that assessment. Um, so once uh, we determine whether a client is a victim, uh, we will be uh, sending the, we'll be doing the assessment framework for a psychological assessments and, and also the other assessment, educational background checks. And then once we've done that, we will uh, uh, present that uh, to the reintegration, from the rehabilitation reintegration committee. So the role of the committee is to uh, mostly to uh, determine the, uh, what's the most effective program for clients to be, um, and to the monitor the effectiveness of the program one more. Uh, one. So, clients, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but we're having some connection difficulties on our end. Okay, we lost him, I guess. Let's wait a couple moments here and see if we get him back. And if not, we may have to rearrange our order. Okay. Um, Aziz Wisname. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Glasses. Хорошо, спасибо. Так, мы, мы потеряли наш uh, предыдущий спикер. Uh, значит, если вы готовы, uh, мы, мы уже начнем с вами. We would like to start. Your speech then. Okay, good. Can... Good day to everybody. I would like to thank everybody no Pontal for providing opportunity. At least we can share, I would say, some minor activities on our part that we have done. My name is Atis Usmanov, I'm 29 years old, and I work on the hereditation related issues for the last seven years. I started when I was old. I will be very brief. The main repatriation has started in 2021. Uh, that was mostly for ICRC. We started work with repatriation, and the first uh, uh, 79 people, uh, 79 children in 2021, we have. Um, found that uh, children were missing the education programs and we have uh, launched the education program uh, in 2022 um, to support with PPCIP. Right now we are contacting the, um, the dialogue with USAP on the repatriates that have been confirmed in this year. And uh, prior to that, USAP have helped us tremendously on educational part for the uh, returned children. And starting from February 2022, uh, with the Green Life Project, AP and Hunkal NOAA, we started to provide um, psychological support uh, for the children and the teachers that are currently working with repatriate uh, children. And within this, the, within the frame of this project, we have uh, supported uh, actually uh, the repatriates uh, from the post traumatic stress. And I would like to mention three important um, factors. Uh, first, we have uh, finished yesterday very important CAP uh, research, and we found out that. Uh, 
to the inside uh, regarding female and the children or for women we see that they are in tremendous need of the profession because they need their kids and since the Kyrgyzstan doesn't have any specific programs like that uh, we uh, use the help from United Nations and other uh, sponsorship programs as such and second that insight is the soul, uh, low self-esteem uh, women tend to feel very guilty and it's very important as well to mention that and with children we found out that children tend to be very closed off they don't like to speak much and three years ago when we received the first um, 79 children same happening with uh, the recent returnees as well uh, this year with support we wanted to see we have uh, launched new methodology um, so the policemen can have more efficient work with, regarding this repatriation. That was a pilot project, but we're happy to um, mention that it worked uh, well. And right now, uh, uh, we have two locations, Varsavansky uh, uh, area, and we the majority of repatriates are located in these two locations. And another thing that I would like to mention, on a daily basis, working with repatriates, we started to have them understand it, that we have no idea about anything. We now start to notice uh, that the problem is in a, in a different place, really. It, it seems like we have no idea what is happening. Even with the help that we are providing to those repatriates, it's just it's just a minor, minor support that they are receiving. It's not enough. And I would also like to mention that I would like to say to everyone who is working in, on this on such programs, including me, all of us, we, we should not make them as a, a lab rats let's say, a test lab people, they are, they are people still. The last research has shown us that they've been, the repatriates have been asked the same questions by all the organizations. We somehow want to help them, but without asking questions. So basically, we should not complicate their lives. We need to simply help them. And thank you all. I have a brief uh, uh, speech like that. I hate to show any slides. That why, uh, that's why I didn't present any slides here. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. OK. Um, uh, Katar Ahmad Aziz. Um, uh, Tolat, I think you're back with us. I'm I'm sorry that we lost you there, um, your connection. So we'd, we'd be happy to welcome you back to resume your presentation. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, apologies for the <laughs> disconnection. Um, yes, so as I was um, uh, continuing with my um, uh, slide, I think that was the process for returnees. Um, uh, so one, once we uh, during the rehabilitation spaces, we still um, take clients to court. Um, uh, there, there's a time limitation for, uh, uh, for example, if the court gives uh, four or six months, for example, uh, once the six months is exhausted, we still take them to the court and ask them, ask the court to extend uh, the the, pro the program. And during that phase, we we also start with the the, re the reintegration phase as well. So we look into the communities that they will be going, um, uh, families, uh, co uh, conduct um, communications with their families. Uh, we also allow them to call the families as well. Um, so I think uh, we think that it will be more effective. Uh, from the beginning, they will be in contact with their families in the Maldives. And we have a pre-risk uh, assessment, also a pre-release assessment for 
the clients. Uh, that's also done by the police. Um, that will determine whether our program, uh, whether a client is ready to be reintegrated or there, if, whether there's a threat uh, from that person, uh, from that individual. And when I meant by client for this risk assessment, I'm talking about um, clients above the age of 15 and adults as well. <clears throat> so children are not subject to this security uh, risk assessment. But but for the sake of um, uh, the family values or family, uh, for the sake of children, we do uh, house children below the age of 15 with their parents, uh, with their mothers. And they are also subject to the rehabilitation program uh, based on their age group. Next slide, please. And once we, uh, if there's a uh, determination of suspect, that if a client is um, from the risk assessment done by the police, once they are considered a suspect, we move to an investigation, criminal investigation that's also under the Terrorism Act. And um, once they are in the, the trial phase, even if they're not guilty of a crime, the court can still order them to undergo a rehabilitation program in prison uh, or in the, in the community as well. But the court can do that. They are still um, required to undergo a rehabilitation program. Next slide, please. And I will be looking into the, the reintegration, the rehabilitation reintegration committee a little bit. So this is a multi-agency. Um, committee that uh, includes five agencies. Actually, there's one missing here, the Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, so Ministry of Home Affairs will chair the committee and we have a representative from Ministry of Gender and Social Services, National Counterterrorism Center, Family and Child Protection Department of the Maldives Police Service and the Counterterrorism Department official, and also a star uh, a official from the Department of Juvenile Justice. So the committee is, again, mandated under the Anti-Terrorism Act to uh, determine the effectiveness and monitor the effectiveness of the rehabilitation program. Next slide, please. The program, the rehabilitation program that we conduct in the National Reintegration Center is based on four components. Um, psychosocial support, um, that's uh, giving mental health awareness and uh, family support, as I mentioned just a while back, um, we do uh, allow clients to contact their families uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, that will depend on the progress of the assessments and how they're progressing in the center. So the, the, the more improvement they show, we will give them more, uh, uh, more phone calls or more visits from their families. And the religious programs, um, counseling, disengagement uh, programs are there. Um, with the education program, this is especially important for children. Uh, we believe that uh, even with the, the first returning families, we experience that uh, some children does not speak the Maldivian language. So that's a um, issue that we face. So once they are brought in, we start the homeschooling uh, program. So we teach them the language, the cultural, uh, areas of Maldives, and the Ministry of Education will do, do an assessment on their education level, and they will um, advise us on what kind of syllabus we have to follow so that they can be enrolled into the school, the local school where the NRC is, the island where the NRC is located. So with the first family, we have uh, successfully done that, and then once they are moved to the island, that's also uh, the, the, from that island also we have enrolled them to school. And the vocational um, part is also important for adults, I think. Um, uh, technical skills development um, programs for the clients, uh, what kind of work they're interested in, and we try to coordinate that with uh, the technical skills development agencies. That's, uh, that's available locally and even in outside of that island. Next slide. So the first returning uh, family uh, returned on March, 2022. So there was a mother and four children and two, the youngest two were born in Syria. 
and they were reintegrated to their community, their island in April this year. Uh, we had a good experience with them, uh, also challenges as well. Next slide, please. The, the family that returned, um, I think, um, uh, please, next slide. So the issues that we faced um, uh, from this experience, um, it's important to uh, look into this and review our program. So that's what we are doing now. Um, we did uh, see that there was a lack of awareness on the issue of um, returning uh, families uh, by the extremism uh, throughout um, uh, other agencies uh, in the Maldives that, that are involved in this work. And since I think that's because we, there is a new experience for the Maldives as well. And um, we also believe that there is a challenge for sh of short term and long term psychosocial support because we have uh, we have very few people trained in this area, and we there is a nationwide issue uh, for the Maldives. Um, even when they are reintegrated into their community, we find difficult to provide that support because there is no um, trained people in that island on this area. So coordination issues there, sharing resources and personnel from other agencies. Um, and the, 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 I think that one of the serious issues that we will face even in the coming, even in the future will be the issues of mental health and the post-traumatic stress disorders. Um, we, we, we think that this will be still a continuing issue. Uh, and from this, the first family, we also faced that. And the mother still takes medication for this. Uh, the children are doing fine. I think um, they're, they're, they're doing well. Uh, but the mother or other adults, uh, even in the future, will be having this issue. Um, and during the reintegration phase, we find a, a bit of challenge to the community engagement, sensitization. Again, awareness. Um, from different communities uh, are, or are at a different level. So uh, this is going to be a challenging uh, area that we are trying to address now. And another issue is that monitoring phase, um, the National Reintegration Center does not have the legal uh, authority to monitor or directly engage with clients. So what we do is we uh, we had formed a multi-agency task force, uh, kind of a, a committee in the local community. So we uh, we are in con constant uh, uh, contact with the with those agencies to look into the uh, affairs of the clients, uh, their well-being. Um, also, multi-agency approach in the community, the local council, health centers, hospital schools. NGOs to be bringing them together is an issue, is a challenge for us. Um, I think um, because of the the new experience in this area, and uh, we coordination between agencies, uh, we find that uh, a growing issue in Maldives. Uh, I hope that um, in the coming uh, months or uh, with the with the arrival of other families, we will be having uh, much less of this issue. And it's important that we will we need support from the families and the local communities. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, with the current family, we we are getting the support. We not 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 to the extent we expected, but still, it's uh, it's at a satisfactory level. Next slide, please. Um, Paula, just to let you know, we've got so about one what, minute left. Um, yeah, sure. And because we want to make sure there's plenty of time uh, for questions. Yeah. So what's worked in the, the first experience we had? Um, so we believe there is a successful reintegration of the family. And uh, uh, because we have admitted the, chi admitted the children in, at, at the local schools and the community engagement uh, and the parent, uh, parents of um, uh, other uh, children at, at, at the school. So. So there, there is a successful part in that. Uh, and we are also able to secure social protection support for single mothers program. Uh, there's a national social protection agency, so they provide um, income support for single mothers. 
So that's something that we believe it's a good good uh, sign for her um, financial situation. At the moment, I think it's too soon to say whether uh, radicalization or uh, violent extremist ideologies are still, uh, she has that tendency to uh, turn into violent extremism probably too soon, but at the moment there's not much of a science of radicalization. Next slide. I think um, that's all for my presentation. I think, uh, sorry, current efforts uh, very quickly. So we, we are working to repatriate uh, uh, on uh, new families. I think there will be 21 people that we will be uh, repatriating. And we have increased the coordination efforts um, and because we are clear, clear roles for other government agencies are already uh, written and documented. And we are building the training and capacity uh, program, especially with the assistance of the counter extremism project supported by the US State Department. So Hunkel has been working with me for the past two, two and a half or years now. Um, and we are also getting assistance from the Transparency Maldives from the Prime Project that's funded by the USAID. So I think we are in very good hands uh, with the international support. Um, so that's it for my presentation. I'm looking forward for your questions, please. Thank you so much for that. Um, we will open up to questions here in just a moment. And I wanted to remind all of those online um, that uh, since there's not a chat function open, uh, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. And um, I guess somebody will let me know when there's questions <laughs> online because I'm, uh, I'm doing the Luddite thing up here. Um, I wanted to just make a couple of comments based on, um, well, you know, first of all, thank you again to all of our speakers this morning. Uh, it's a real privilege to get to hear uh, from frontline practitioners um, in so many different contexts. Uh, I think some of the things that we heard from all of the presentations together um, is that a real strength, at least in my mind, of each of these programs has been that it's very human focused. Um, as Gulnaz mentioned, uh, Kazakhstan has defined their reintegration process as primarily a humanitarian project. Um, and I think that certainly changes the way that um, the services that are offered and the array of services and the order in which they're offered, and I think has done a lot um, in each of these cases um, to to contribute to the success um, that has been had. And I think it's worth noting that um, in each of these contexts, there's not necessarily a great deal of public support and sympathy for that, um, for, for treating people as humans first. Um, and uh, But I, I think we, I'll be interested to hear from our speakers and other questions, you know, the extent to which that may have been key to success. Um, making a clear delineation in several of the contexts between those who are classified as victims of extremism and those who are uh, brought to responsibility as perpetrators, I think has also been really important um, in success in an area where, as we might discuss this afternoon, um, Kyrgyzstan has been less has yet to make a decision about how it will handle that um, part. And I think that will have a huge effect on their program going forward. Um, another one of the commonalities between these are recognizing that community resources and, and applying a community-based approach is really important. And uh, it struck me that as different as these three contexts are, um, one of the challenges that they each face and that I suspect had a great deal to do with the factors that drove um, people out in the first place is that many, um, each of these countries is characterized by having sort of extreme peripheries. Um, the Maldives are an archipelago <laughs> that are um, where islands are very, very far separated from one another and sometimes difficult to get to. Uh, Kazakhstan is the direct opposite. It's one of the largest countries by landmass in the world. But the cities, in effect, 
are the same way. Um, they are a kind of archipelago that are separated from one another by hundreds of kilometers, not good transit in some cases, and extremely uneven distribution of resources and access to services in the places that many of the returnees came from and are returning back to. And Kyrgyzstan is a country that is about 85% mountain, <laughs> and um, the north and south of the country are divided by an extremely high mountain range um, and no longer joined even, um, even for logistics and transit in the way that it once was um, in the Soviet period. So it, it presents another extreme challenge, and one of the difficulties that we have come up against trying to support that program um, is that you know most of the returnees are children, most of them have gone back to southern Kyrgyzstan, and there is not a single child psychologist in all of southern Kyrgyzstan. Um, so what do we do about that, and how do we get around that challenge, recognizing that we face it? Um, so I apologize for abusing the moderator's privilege there, and I want to turn over to the room um, questions that you have for our, our excellent panelists. Hi, this is coming in from our virtual viewers. Um, this first question is for Toloth. How do you deal with cases that are victim and suspect? For example, men that have committed crimes while with ISIS but have a war trauma, or women who were involved in terrorist propaganda but were abused by their husbands. Secondly, how many more Maldive nationals remain in Syria and Iraq? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Sophia, for this question. Um, at the moment, we, we don't have any men that's coming back. Um, we had a case in 2020, I think um, uh, one person returned by his own, um, by his own travel uh, expenses, and then um, <clears throat> we found out he came back, and then uh, the same process started. He was considered a suspect, at the, but subsequently, the court decided to drop the case because there was no evidence. Um, so we put him under monicon and control order. I think that's um, still an ongoing case. Um, uh, so even with the majority of uh, people who are about to return, we have uh, probably more than 90% is women and children. Um, so at the moment, we don't have this experience for men. Uh, and women who were involved in terrorist propaganda but were abused by their husbands. I think um, um, we consider most of the time, I think um, even with the current family, the first uh, uh, assessment showed that she was a suspect, but because she had children um, as young as four year olds, I, uh, we had to um, keep her in the rehabilitation center because we believe that it was the best interest of the children that if we separate the mother, that then it will be much worse for it. So we, we have ways to deal with um, women who were involved in um, some kind of act, but still, because they have children, uh, we cannot just separate them and then put them in, uh, in custody. Um, but still, um, with the new arrivals, I think we might still have um, that issue with the uh, women involved in terrorist acts, but again, that will depend on the, the assessments. And how many more Maldivian nationals remain in Syria? Probably about um, uh, 170, uh, but I think very few, uh, I think about 70 or a, bit, a little bit above that will return to Maldives. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's so nice to see you and hear you, uh, Tholef, uh, Anne Speckard. Hello. I don't know if you can see us. But yes, I'm just, I can. <laughs> I'm curious about the ones. We interviewed some of them in um, Syria and gave the notes to NCTC. And I'm just wondering 
is there any timeline for them to come home? Because the longer those kids stay in Syria, the worse it is, and the women do mm -hmm. have PTSD, trauma, and it just seems like it's exacerbating the longer they stay, especially in Al Hol, although the ones we talked to were in Al Roj. But Al Roj is pretty tough too right now. Yeah. yeah. We do we do have a plan under under the reintegr the repatriation plan. We uh, we are trying the first mem the first group that we are going to bring is now in a Turkish facility. So that's twenty one um, individuals, including uh, children. Uh, once we bring them back, uh, uh, we'll be starting to repatriate people in the camps. I'm not sure about a timeline for people in the camps, but I think um, uh, we will be bringing them sometime next year, probably before uh, for August. And I, I hope that answers your question. Um, and also, we are in a uh, transition process because of the elections we had um, in uh, last September. Um, so that, that there might be changes in the new government policy, but I don't think there will be major changes because uh, from a meeting I had today with the transition team, they they think that this issue will have to con uh, the the programs will have to continue, and they see this as a very sensitive issue as well. So I think there's an understanding from that team as well that there is an important effort that we will need to continue. Hi, thank you so much for your presentations. Can you talk a little bit more about the case management systems that you are using, what the strengths and weaknesses of them might be? Um, if Who actually manages the, the overall process and decides the basket of services that are on offer, particularly if they are um, cross-departmental? Is that question toward anyone in particular? Okay, yeah. Gulnaz, uh, Snachala. No. Вопрос лично было? Ну, у нас, если касается программ реабилитации, as for rehabilitation programs, the main governmental agency has coordinated all the uh, all the uh, cases. This is the religion uh, committee. They are supervising the rehabilitation programs. And as for the prosecution, uh, and of course, that is the security uh, department of Republic of Kazakhstan. So it's few national agent, the governmental agencies uh, that are undertaking this responsibility, again, looking at what is the goal, whether it's the journalist that we work in, or, or is it the prosecution, or is, the, or, or is it the post prison rehabilitation, whichever program we are talking about? So, looking at it, and that might be a multiple agencies from government side. Um, Tolat, do you want to take this one next? Sorry, what was the question? I, I, I couldn't hear that much. Uh, it's about case management. What's what's the system oh, for okay. case management that you use, and, and who takes responsibility for determining the, the basket of services that people receive? So, um, so NRC has a um, uh, psychosocial support um, section. Um, so they, they will be doing all these assessments and determining how the, the program will continue. Um, so we will, the Rehabilitation and Reintegration Committee will not be involved in that process. Um, we, they will recommend the, the, the path forward and that's what we will be taking into account.
And in the case management, at the moment, it's um, uh, done by that uh, section, the psychosocial support section. So the, 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 there are psych, uh, social workers and uh, they, they will do the case management. Um, if you are still interested in more details on this question for Central Asia, we can come back to it in our panel where we do that. Um, so they are managed on sort of a municipal level um, by a cluster of different agencies, but, but case management is one of the things that we feel like may be an area that could use some additional support um, in, in, those, in those countries. So other questions from the room or anybody else online? Looks like we have more. We have about five minutes left. Okay, great. Uh, this comes in from Timothy, uh, addressed to Aziz in Kyrgyzstan. How important is it to prepare the community for reintegration in these contexts? For instance, where would you find the balance between focusing on the individual for reintegration and focusing on preparing the community to accept reintegration of the individual? Thank you for this question. It is interesting and a complicated question. The problem with balance is we, the international, uh, in, international support was tremendous, but the local society had concerns regarding the some type of um, negative uh, impact on the society. So one woman approached me and she said that she didn't have a husband, he died a long time ago, and she said she has two children and they need additional education. And I, on, from my side, said that we have some educational program from um, returnees from Syria. And she said, so... Does it mean that I need to go to Syria and return back home from Syria so you can help me? So right now we are considering maybe helping not only women, the returnees, but also maybe uh, for the for the, the the whole class of people, like uh, for the whole grade uh, of the children. The grades might be like 20 children in one grade. Maybe we can help all of them. We're considering that right now. Thank you all. Спасибо огромное, Шукурия. Having had the uh, pleasure of meeting Mr. Talat in person earlier this year, and having had the honor of visiting NRC and seeing some of the wonderful uh, educational efforts and hard work that were underway, I wanted to ask of maybe potential lessons learned in the process of reintegration of children to the mainstream educational system. And this is directed at our Maldivian colleague, but also anyone else on the panel. I'm sure there are plenty of lessons from these initial processes. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. The, the, I I think the school system was uh, quite a challenge, but um, uh, we did have a very extensive engagement uh, with the the local schools that NRC is located. Um, we did have some hesitance from uh, a few parents at the, um, and I think um, I'll probably be uh, addressing Timothy Clancy's question as well from this. Um, um, yes, the community engagement in the, the island where NRC is located was also an important uh, area that we had to um, uh, engage um, when we were, uh, when we, before we start sending the children to school, we did engage with the local school there. Um, yes, we did have some uh, hesitation from some parents and we had to engage with them, explain them the situation whether these children were risk or not. Um, we had to explain to them that these children are still uh, victims um, of, uh, uh, of that conflict. Um, and they had, they, that's, that, that's not their fault to be in a conflict zone. So that kind of um, engagement was conducted. And I think um, um, that 
improving community support, I think uh, uh, when we bring together uh, the local councils and schools together, we think that um, it works and then engaging with the parenting of schools, parents of um, uh, school children uh, is an important um, area that we did. Um, and it was quite an effective way that uh, these children could go into the school and then uh, did not have any issues with stigmatization. Um, uh, undermine, I think the strategies that can undermine adoption rates is still a lack of awareness between communities. People uh, are very fearful, I think, uh, in the communities that uh, uh, clients who are coming from conflict zones may have a bad impact on their community. So that's uh, something uh, we can we think that can be addressed with awareness and more engagement. I think a continuous and a constant engagement can be the effective, the more more effective way to address this. So we have just two minutes left. Um, I'd be happy to collect maybe two questions, if we have them in the room or any more online. Um, it's a piggyback question to the first question that was asked, but around children and adolescents. How is it adjudicated when it's the children or adolescent that has perpetrated violence? Mm. Um, because they are very clearly victims of their, the mm. adults in their lives um, and have been pushed into the situation. So how is that adjudicated? And then how are they then rehabilitated and reintegrated? We've heard a little bit about that, but it takes on a different dimension. Do I need to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> I think in, in the more is the anti-terrorism is very clear how to deal with children. Um, they also need to undergo a certain uh, program because they have been, um, uh, some children are born in conflict zones. So we have to uh, rehabilitate them in order to, for them to reintegrate and uh, get familiar with the Maldivian culture. And we do uh, know, understand that children are, uh, victims of conflict, so we don't treat them as suspects. Um, I know there are some interesting answers to this question from Kazakhstan as well, but I'm getting 